Okay, hello. Um, it's really great to be here. Uh, I spoke at the, the last uh, AxCon uh, also virtually, um, so it's really nice to be back. Um, since last time, I got a new job. I'm now a technical writer on the Chrome DevRel team. I'm content lead for web.dev and developer.chrome.com. And I'm also a member of the CSS Working Group, and there I'm especially interested in layout. Uh, there's some resources and code related to this talk at the URL on screen. That's notice slash Rachel Andrew. Now, before you start thinking of questions to ask me, um, I'll just remind you that I'm a bit of an imposter here because I'm not really an accessibility expert. I'm a web developer and a writer who cares about accessibility and how it relates to the things that, that I do with CSS. And what I'm going to cover today is really a kind of updated version of the talk I gave last year. Um, because I've kept some things in because they haven't changed. And I think they're still very important to think about. And some things have started to improve, which is great. And we've also got a bunch of new things coming to CSS. If you've been kind of looking at what's happening in CSS recently, uh, you'll find there's an awful lot of really cool new stuff happening. Uh, you know, we have things like container queries, subgrid, cascade layers, new color functions. You know, you can't look at Twitter without seeing someone really excited about something new that's coming to the web platform. Now, not all of those things raise particular accessibility concerns, but, you know, others could, and that might be in a good way or a bad way. And even things that seem like they shouldn't really affect accessibility could cause an issue if they cause an unexpected problem somewhere else, or perhaps they cause a change in development habits, and that leads to problems. So there's always things to think about when we get new tools to play with um, and how they might affect some of our users. So I'm going to start with CSS Grid. And this is something I've been talking about for, for a lot of years now. And one of the first things I thought was really exciting about Grid was that it gave us, for the very first time, a proper separation of content and presentation. Now, that was something we used to talk about a lot right in the early days of CSS Layout. Because before we had CSS for layout, we used tables. And tables mixed relational data with content. And if you used a table for layout, you were making decisions about layout in your markup. So if I had a table with three columns for my site and a header that would span all of those columns, I'd add call span equals three to make it so. Now, even worse, tables for layout, especially ones we nested tables into table cells and fragmented our content between them, they could be pretty inaccessible to screen readers. Because if anything didn't understand the layout, content was kind of all broken up. So when we started to use CSS for layout, we started to talk about this, this idea of separating our content and document structure from presentation. And with the launch of the CSS Zen Garden, this idea became kind of mainstream. And the web moved away from tables as the primary layout mechanism, slowly but surely. But while sites like CSS and Garden showed that one document could be presented in different ways, layout was still tied to document structure. Now, if you've been doing web development for a long time, you might have heard people talk about the holy grail layout. Now, this described something as complicated as a three-column layout, where your columns could be in any order in the markup. And this was actually pretty tricky to achieve if you wanted to have a flexible central area. Uh, this is a screenshot of a demo from the List Apart article which explained how to do this. And then many of us were using sort of float-based column systems before Grid and Flexbox showed up. Again, these things very much tied to their markup. Uh, this is the markup of a row using the bootstrap float-based grid. And you can see in this markup that each row of content is sort of encased in um, a div with a class of row. And then each of your columns in there have got classes on to say how big they are. Now, you can sort of put your things in the rows there, but because you can only float left or right, the items have to stay roughly in source order. So this wasn't actually a completely bad thing. And the fact that we couldn't easily move too far away from document structure stopped us all making a right old mess, you know, and just forgetting completely about the structure of the document and just positioning things using CSS. Um, the only real way um, until we got grid 
um, to move an item completely away from where it sat in the document was to use absolute positioning. And it's very, very difficult to build a robust layout using absolute positioning. If you try, we certainly did back in the day. Um, so we didn't really head down that path too much. So what we were working with is, is what we call normal flow. And you've got the ability to take things out of that flow, but you can really only sort of go around uh, with floats and so on. So the design flows along with the content. We can't jumble it up too much. But now with grid, we can have a layout which is separate from the content. We can reorder things at different breakpoints. This restriction of source order affecting layout is gone. We can switch those columns around any way that we want. So this is the CSS needed to do the holy grail layout with grid. You don't need to jump through any hoops to make this work. You do it in a few lines of CSS. And we also get full height columns in the grid version, uh, which was impossible with the floated version. So this huge limitation has, has gone. It's been removed from us. But really, it's technically gone. But in terms of accessibility, it still very much exists. Like many things on the web and in life, just because you can do them doesn't mean that you should. And disconnecting your visual display from your source order is very much one of those things. The reading order of the content in your source, that's the order that a user tabbing around your content is going to follow. It's the order the screen reader is going to announce your content. So switching a couple of columns around, that, that might be all right. But it can get worse. And I'm going to show you some demos which will all be found in the resources for this talk so you can have a play with them yourself. So here's some examples. Um, this is a grid. Again, you know, hardly any CSS. We can build our layout there. I'm using grid template areas. And I'm sort of positioning some cards on the grid using grid template areas. So that gives me a layout that looks like this. Um, and I've given each of the cards a number so you can see the order that they are in the source. The numbers on the cards are the actual number where they would appear in the source document. Um, now, if you were to start tabbing around this layout, you see that you're going to tab around in the order that they are in the source. Now, that would be a very, very confusing way to navigate around a document. And imagine if it was a, a great big long list of products, for example, um, that you were tabbing around, you'd be jumping around all over the place doing something like that. Um, and this link will allow you to try that out live and so you can tab around the document and see how it feels. And also in Grid, we have this, this cool uh, value dense and this turns on a dense packing mode. Now what this does is if you have got an auto place layout, so you're allowing grid to lay the items out. Now if you do that, grid will try and fill the gaps with items that come later in the source if you're using grid auto flow dense. And um, so this dense packing mode, if you get gaps because some items are bigger, they'll get filled up by grid. And again, this can leave you with a very strange progression around the cards because you find that, you know, a smaller card will get picked up and put into a gap earlier in the layout. So that's another place where you need to be a little bit careful. Now, I've been talking here about grid layout and the problem is at its worst with grid layout because you can move things around in two dimensions. So you can end up with something which is logically right at the top of your document and you can dump it right at the bottom of the screen, you know, and that could be several scrolls down. Um, but you can have this problem with Flexbox too. Um, if you set your flex direction to row reverse, that will reverse the items and it will also mean that you appear to tab backwards through the navigation which that might not be ideal. It's a little bit of a strange way for you to move um, if you're using English, which is electrolyte language. Again, you can try this out and see how that feels. So this is a problem that I keep talking about because I want people to be aware of this problem as they're getting excited about the possibilities of new layout. And I do feel when I teach this stuff and, and when I've sort of taught this to people in workshops and uh, particularly in the early days of grid, when it was all new to people, I'd show them all these things. And 
you know, they'd immediately start saying, oh, this is great. You know, I can change things for different breakpoints. I can have a very different layout for mobile users than I do on the desktop. Um, and it kind of feels then when you talk about the accessibility issue that you've shown people this wonderful new idea and then said, oh, but don't use it. Um, make sure that you stay in, in source order. And uh, so it does feel like it, you know, it might be um, something that, that kind of takes stuff away from developers and you have to take care of. As it happens, I think in most cases, the layout will naturally follow source order, but you do need to keep it in mind as you work. This is definitely one of those places where you're going to make accessibility very hard for yourself if you don't think about this from the start. So I think the important thing is just not to forget about the document. When we first started using CSS for layout, we often used to say things like, you know, load your document without the CSS and see if it still makes sense. And this actually is still a very, very good tip. If you load your document without any of the CSS involved, can you read it? Because HTML is naturally readable. If things are marked up properly, uh, it, it should be something which someone could follow, could tab around. It's going to make sense. If that's the case, then you're probably not going too far wrong. Um, you can then start to arrange things, uh, knowing that things are flowing in the right order. So working with a sensible document is, is going to make your life a lot easier. And work with normal flow. Normal flow is what things in CSS layout do when we don't do any layout. So this is if you just you know, go with what the browser does, um, and you've got this readable document. When you're using grid layout or Flexbox, you change, um, you know, you set display grid on something, the direct children become grid items, but what's inside goes back to normal flow. So if you work with normal flow as much as you can, um, you're keeping things in source order, and you're actually letting the browser do an awful lot of things for you. Now, something that uh, I sort of bring up quite a bit is the fact that if you've got a well-ordered document, uh, you can create fallbacks for older browsers, for browsers that don't support some of the stuff you're using. You can create those an awful lot more easily. The reason being, again, is because things fall back to normal flow. And often that's OK. You know, at this point, if you want to make sure that people using, say, Internet Explorer can read your content, you might be pretty happy if actually what they get is just a sort of a, a simple reading of the document, you know, the, the heading and the content and so on. And maybe it is all one after the other in normal flow. But actually, that's fine. You're leaving them with something, you know, that is readable. That's probably better than, than being left with something which is a complete mess because the things that you're using aren't supported. Um, and if you want to do more of a complete fallback solution, say you want to fall back um, grid to a floated layout, if things are in a good order, you're going to be able to do that floated layout much easier. And then test the tab order. Um, it's not just about screen readers. Screen, you know, screen readers are going to read the, the document um, in, in the order that it is, but people who are, say, navigating around with the keyboard, they're the people who are going to really experience this weird jumping about um, if you've got your tab order all mixed up. So here you can see um, the tab order of, of the demo I showed earlier and how someone is having to jump around all over um, to access all of the content. And then resist the temptation to flatten out your source to make everything a child of the grid container. And this is really important. I think the fact that when you say display grid or display flex, it's only those direct children that start becoming flex or grid items. That kind of makes it a bit tempting sometimes to achieve layouts by just removing semantic markup. So, you know, do we really need to make this a list or could we just have this a bunch of divs and then they'd be really easy to position? Uh, so resist that temptation. If something's a list, make it a list and then worry about how to deal with it. Because semantic structures like lists are, you know, really important for people to be able to understand what your content is. But this is something which I think is getting better. This temptation to flatten out markup is somewhere where I think things are have made progress um, since last time I talked about this. Because uh, we've got a couple of ways though, with semantic boxes. Now, which you choose depends on how you want your layout to behave. Now, do you want the boxes so you can style them, but just want everything inside aligned to a grid, even if it's not a direct child? 
In that case, you probably want subgrid. Now, it might be that you want the semantic box. You want to be able to say to the browser, hey, this is a list, but you'd like the box to vanish for styling purposes. In that case, you want to look at display contents. So we'll take a look at subgrid first. Uh, at the moment, um, it is just there in Firefox. Uh, the subgrid value of grid template rows and grid template columns means that child items can inherit the grid from their parents. And this means you can keep semantic structures, make the child a grid, set the properties to subgrid, and you can basically you know, inherit grids all the way down. You can keep on um, making things a subgrid of the parent. So that's a great way if you want to keep all the boxes and uh, maybe style them up, but you just want things to align with things that aren't, you know, other, other um, siblings, then subgrid will let you do that. So um, an example of that, uh, this is sort of the, the straightforward example of using subgrid. Um, we've got cards here that are in a grid, but the individual cards don't sort of line up with each other. Um, each card's got a heading and some text and a button. And because some of the headings are longer and wrap onto two lines, uh, the lines underneath the headings don't line up across the cards. That's the sort of thing where a designer is going to look at it and say, it would look much nicer if those uh, lines all lined up across the cards. And this is where we can use subgrid. So here we create three rows for each card on the parent, span the card across them, and then set grid template rows to subgrid. And that basically means that all our headings are in the same row, and so they can respect the height of the tallest item. Um, and so that then gives us the effect of all the lines under the headings aligned across the grid, even if the content in that box is smaller. And uh, you can have a look at that. Uh, so you'll, you'll need to have Firefox to see that working. So that's subgrid. So that's one way in which we can sort of solve this flattening out of markup problems. And this is something that is currently being worked on um, by the Microsoft Edge for Chrome. So hopefully we'll see it in Chrome really soon. And then that will be something that we can use really well. It also works nicely as a progressive enhancement. So you can start using subgrid as a progressive enhancement. So browsers that don't support subgrid see the slightly wonky version, but it's fine. It's all readable. If they support subgrid, you get the nice lined up version. So you can use it in small ways as a progressive enhancement. Um, and then as browsers roll out support, you'll be able to sort of get the better display. And then we have display content. So this is a new value for display. And this is really useful because it removes semantic elements which are not needed in layout. If you think about display none, what display none does is it removes a box and all of its contents as if it was never there. If you use display contents, it removes that particular box but leaves whatever's inside there which means that you can essentially promote some um, grandchildren to, to direct children to allow them to participate in a flex or a grid layout. So here I've got a layout. It includes some items directly inside a container that are divs, and then you've got um, a UL. So that's the direct child of the container, and it's got some children. Um, and this would give us this rather unusual layout. So what I've got there is I've got the first div, then the second div display next to each other as flex items. Then we get the UL, which becomes a flex item because it's the direct child, but its children go back to normal flow. So they display one below the other. They're not part of the flex layout. If we add display contents to the UL, then that box gets removed from the layout, but the children stay. And this means then that our list items can participate in the flex layout. So this is really useful if you want to be um, marking something up uh, semantically, but then displaying, you're actually displaying the, the items as if they were direct children, this will work. Now, a little bit of a warning, this has improved uh, in the last year, but there is a bug in display contents. Um, it, it basically was a bug in the implementation. The, the spec wasn't particularly clear, I think is really what happened there. Uh, when browsers implemented it, they implemented it like display none, but then put the children back. Um, now, the thing with display none is it's the only uh, value of display that is supposed to also affect um, things like screen readers and so on. It basically just removes the item as if it was never there and nothing 
um, is going to announce it. Nothing's, it's not going to appear in the accessibility tree. So by implementing it like this, um, by, you know, the, the, the accessibility information about, say, a list in, in my demo would also be removed. So, the, so exactly what it's good for, maintaining this semantic information, um, was kind of being ruined. This has been fixed in Chrome 89 and in Fire, from Firefox 62. So in, in Chrome and Firefox, you can safely use this. Um, I thought it was going to be fixed in the version of Safari that has just come out. In fact, they announced that it was fixed and then said that, no, it didn't appear in it. So hopefully the fact that it got pre-announced um, means that they are working on it. It will soon be fixed in Safari. But this is something you're really going to have to test if you're using display contents at the moment. Um, but hopefully, fingers crossed, it will be coming soon. And um, it's absolutely fine to use display contents to remove a box that doesn't have any accessibility information. So, for example, if you're using a div, maybe to create a fallback for a browser that doesn't support something, and you use display contents to get rid of that div, that's absolutely fine. That's not going to cause anyone a problem. It's where you want to maintain the accessibility information. Um, and you can uh, test this. You can see it working. If you look at the accessibility tree viewer in DevTools, um, this is Chrome DevTools, you can see that the items that use display content are still a list of list items, uh, despite the fact that we can't see their parent box. Um, and that accessibility tree I was using, um, that's a new tree that's available in Chrome uh, 98 DevTools, uh, the full accessibility tree. Um, so there's a blog post here on develops.chrome.com, which explains all the details. And it's kind of a new way to, to explore the accessibility tree. And really just as an aside, when we're talking about removing things from the accessibility tree and, and changing their information, um, if you're changing display type, um, you know, for instance, you're make, using display table to make something, use table layout properties that isn't a table or your turning a table into a grid with display grid, um, do check that, again, you're not changing how it's reported in terms of to assistive devices. Make sure that if something is marked up as a table, your CSS isn't stopping it um, being a table and so on. And maybe something else is, is to take care of. Don't be tempted to fix problems in your source by playing with order in Flexbox or rearranging items in grid. If you've decided, you know, you want um, about to come after contact, do it in the HTML, not in your CSS. Um, so, you know, here I've got a bunch of items in uh, there in the order they are in the source. But because I've decided I want the navigation item for penguins to come first, I decided, oh, I'm, I'm not going to mess with the source. I'll just do that in my CSS. And I've used the order property there um, in, in with my flex items which has the effect I want visually. Um, you know, penguins now comes first, but you can see that actually in the tab order, it's not first at all. So order isn't affecting anything other than the visual order. And that's pretty much the case with CSS. It's going to change the visual display, but it's not going to change anything about the structure. So... That's uh, some tips for actually using layout and so on, and, and, and some little improvements with, with some of the things that can help us. Um, but I also wanted to have a look at some of the new stuff that it has landed or is landing, is, is sort of coming into browsers, because we've got some pretty exciting stuff coming. Now, I think the thing that most web developers are excited about and are waiting to, to land properly in browsers uh, is container queries. So you can test out container queries in Chrome Canary, and they're sort of well on their way. This is something that developers have wanted for a very long time. So here's a very simple use of container queries. We create a container using the container type property, and then we can query it in a very similar way to if we were using media queries. There's a bit more to the spec, but it's actually, in terms of usage, I think is going to be pretty straightforward because we're used to using media queries. And so I think fairly quickly, people are going to start having components that use container queries. Now, in itself, um, shouldn't cause too many problems with accessibility. Um, you know, really just you know, as long as you're developing in a sort of sensible way and caring about source order and things that, you know, they shouldn't really cause too much problem. I think probably the thing to watch um, is that 
we're going to be able to use the same component in different places on our site much easier with container queries. We're not going to have to completely rebuild things because of you know, where it is um, in the structure. So you might have a component that goes in the sidebar and has one layout and you know, goes in the main body of the page with another layout. Now, when you move things around the structure of your site, quite often that means you need to change the markup. You know, it's a really simple example. You know, I've got a, it's a media object here with, with a heading. And in one location, that heading, you know, should be an H2. In another location, we want it to be an H3. So I think that's probably going to be the thing to be thinking about with when we use more components um, because we can with container queries. <coughs> is that you know you want to make sure that you can change the markup to fit the location that it's in. Um, so for instance, if you use classes for the styling, rather than selecting the elements, so selecting the heading, then you can more easily change the markup as you move things around the site. So we hope you'll be seeing container queries coming to, to browsers um, really soon. And so that's just one thing to be thinking about there. And then we have um, Focus Visible. Um, and this lets you detect if someone's navigating using the keyboard and, and make some choices there. Now, if you're keyboard navigating, you rely on the focus ring to know which element is selected. Um, so a highly visible focus ring can really help those users. It might be a bit distracting, though, if someone's using the mouse. And so Focus Visible allows you to detect, detect when people are using a mouse and remove the focus ring. And you can sort of, you know, play around with that and see, you know, is it visible or not? Now, there's a, sort of a little point just to take care of here. It's something you want to test because some people might be using the mouse and also the keyboard to navigate. Um, and they might find that the ring appears and disappears. When, when they're doing that. Um, I'm actually an example of a person who does this. I use the keyboard to navigate a lot. Uh, I've got one hand that doesn't work so well because I smashed up my elbow. So I, I use a trackpad with my non-dominant hand. Um, and then I, you know, for quite a lot of things, particularly if I'm navigating the web, I'll switch to my keyboard and then just use the mouse for certain things, use the trackpad for certain things. Now I'm a web developer and I know about focus visible. So if I had this appearing and disappearing focus ring, I'd be like, oh, I know what's going on there. But a lot of users are not going to be aware of that and, and just might become a bit confused as to where they are in the document. So, again, that's something to test and test with, you know, mixed modality use. You know, move between the mouse and the keyboard and see how it works. There's also loads of fun color stuff happening in browsers. Um, in the Safari technology preview, you can try out the color contrast function. Now, this takes a color and then selects from a list the color with the highest contrast. Uh, now, this is really interesting. I, I spent a lot of my career developing content management systems and things where people actually want to change maybe the color theme, um, you know, by adding, adding one color, changing their background color and, and, and a theme color, and, and then hopefully everything still works. One of the problems with doing that is that you can end up with contrast issues. Um, because you can't expect people to pick every single thing. You end up having to have some colours which are part of the system and trying to make a best guess as to what's going to work. Um, so I think that you know this is quite a useful one. It allows you to have a colour and a list of other colours and then the browser select, which is the highest contrast. And it looks like this. It works with um, a, a, a colour put there or you can use um, custom properties. So here I've got a custom property for the background colour. Um, and then I am detecting, you know, working out whether white or black has got the highest contrast, and then it, it will use that colour um, on, on, the, on the background. And so I've got an example of that there on CodePen, and you can try that out. Uh, let's say you need to use Safari Technology Preview to try that out at the moment. Uh, but it's quite fun here. You can throw different background colours at it and and see what happens, which is picked. Um, so I think that's going to be quite a useful one. It's quite a practical thing. Um, but there's lots of other interesting colour functions coming through in general, obviously, with colour. And um, typically, if you're doing clever things with colour, it's you know making sure that you've got that colour contrast there. That's, that's the important thing. 
And uh, then we have um, some media features, uh, which I think are pretty exciting. Um, we've got things like prefers color scheme. Uh, now, this tests to see if they've got dark mode enabled in their operating system and allows you to display your site using the dark theme. So we can, you know, take their operating system preference and carry it through into the website. So there's a whole bunch of these um, user preference media features. We've got prefers reduced motion, which checks, you know, to the, whether someone has asked for less motion. And then you can, you know, do less animation on your site. You can not have things move around quite as much. We can have prefers reduced transparency, prefers contrast, prefers color scheme we've looked at, forced colors, and prefers reduced data. So all of these are looking for preferences the user has actually set. So we can check for color scheme light. The user wants to use the light color scheme. Now, when we're doing this sort of thing, uh, it's worth remembering that your dark theme may not be more accessible. It might be that the user likes dark mode on their operating system because obviously the operating system, lots of work's been put in to you know, make that dark mode as accessible as possible. And you've got two themes and you present them with the dark theme because you've noticed that they, they like to use dark theme. Now, they might not find your dark theme as accessible. It might be hard to read. Uh, so if you're doing that, you know, make sure you've got a way for the users to toggle to the alternate. If they're finding your dark theme hard to read, let them switch to your light theme and see if that's better. Um, this is an article which is all about how to create that sort of theme toggle. Yeah, you know, I think it's absolutely fine to present them with what you think they want um, if they've expressed a preference, but always let them, you know, get out and get and try the other one. Um, it might work better for them. And it's always good to give people the choice rather than assume that because their operating system's in dark mode, they also want every website that they visit to be in dark mode too. And then we've got the color scheme property. Now this is now supported in all of the browsers. And this helps you deal with situations where part of your page needs to be rendered in a particular color scheme. So you're going to let the, the user switches to dark mode. The user, they're using a dark color scheme, but there's something in your page that would become inaccessible or where the colors are very important and you don't want that to be switched to a dark theme. Um, so you can actually say that, you know, you want this component to be rendered in a different color scheme. So here, you know, I've got a widget that I want to be rendered color scheme light. And we also have um, a forced colors media feature. And what this detects are things like Windows high contrast mode. Um, so you can see if the user is using that and act accordingly. Again, another media feature. So it's a forced colors active and then we can do any customizations for that. Now, I really like these user preference media features. Um, you know, I remember when, you know, responsive design became a thing and we were, you know, could sort of detect, you know, we could change our sites to work depending on whether someone was using um, a desktop browser that had lots of screen real estate or whether they were using, you know, a phone. And that seemed, you know, that, that, that was amazing that we could respond to user needs in that way. Now we can actually find out, you know, what the user has directly asked their device to do. You know, the user has said, look, motion is a real problem to me. You know, I, I really struggle with a lot of movement. And we can respond to that. We can give them something which really works for them. I, you know, I, I think this is, there's so many small changes you can make, um, you know, particularly when we're talking about CSS. It's so easy for us, you know, to dial down the animation. Um, to check whether they want animation before doing it. Um, things like first reduced data, you know, being able to be responsive to the fact that the user is, you know, worrying about the amount of data that they use and not loading big images, not sort of, you know, bringing down video or, or large font files and so on. There's lots of things that we can do with just a little bit of care. And by thinking about this stuff up front as, we, as we're designing our sites, we're building our sites, um, you know, we can make a real difference. Now, and if you're a developer, share this information with your designers because they, it really helps them to, to see these as sort of user-centric possibilities when they're coming up with designs, knowing that they can sort of understand where the user wants dark mode or is in a high contrast. They can then use their skills as a designer 
um, to make a, a better experience for all of the users. And so really just to wrap this up, as I've said a few times during this talk, test it, make sure you test it. Um, as we're getting new stuff into browsers, uh, it can cause other problems. It may be that that feature um, and its sort of normal usage, you know, isn't going to expose any issues, but you use it alongside something else and suddenly you find there's an accessibility problem or some other problem. Um, it's really important to test things. Uh, you might think that, well, you know, there's like hundreds and hundreds of thousands of web developers. I'm not going to be the first person to run into this. You would be surprised because a lot of people do run into things and think it's them. And, and, you know, just use something else and don't think about it anymore. Actually, the number of people reporting the issues is quite small. So do test things and, you know, make sure, test with lots of different users and make sure that they are doing what you think they will do. Because even things that are des designed for accessibility can obviously cause a problem to, to some set of users. And as I say, you know, don't assume that somebody else is going to go and report these issues. Um, it might be that really you're the first person who's really identified what the problem is. So do raise bugs with browsers. There's a, a link in my resources that can help you uh, know where to raise problems. It is never a problem to raise a bug with a browser. Um, if it turns out it's not actually an issue and it, it happened to be something in your code. That's, that's not a problem. It's not going to upset anybody. It, people would browsers would much rather hear about the issues that are appearing. And also for me, you know, someone who writes about this stuff, if people are running into problems, okay, it might not be a browser issue, but maybe that's an issue, something we need to be talking about. And we need to be sharing with the community how to use that thing in a good way. Um, so do raise issues that you come across. Uh, don't assume that someone else will have logged it. Don't assume it's your code. Um, it's never a problem to raise issues. So, so please do that. And I've left some time for questions. And thank you very much. Uh, the link to my resources is also on screen. Thank you very much, Rachel. Let's get into some questions here. And just a reminder, you can still submit questions under the Q&A tab in the uh, chat box. OK, first question is, how do I diplomatically instruct my designers to include the CSS architecture, formatting, annotations in their work uh, so it gets conveyed to the developer? Right. So, a CSS, so we're talking about the different change, the changes that you might want to make um, based on accessibility and things like color scheme and so on. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think it's, you know, it's bringing it back to the user. I, I don't know many designers who want to be designing things in a user hostile way. Um, I think generally, if you're a designer, you, you, you're wanting to, to help people. Um, and I think, you know, if you're being diplomatic about it, it, it really is about you want them to give you enough information to be able to help users and to be able to carry their design through for all of these users. Um, you know, the site should be great for someone who wants dark mode. It should be great for someone who wants less movement. Uh, you know, all of these things can still be a fantastic experience. And I think that's really the conversations we should be having with designers and with developers, because, you know, there's, there's plenty of developers who, you know, just want to get things done as quickly as possible as well. You know, I think across the team, it's about the focus is on the user and where they are and their needs and giving them the best experience of your site, your application, your product that they can, um, you know, by sort of taking advantage of all of this stuff. So I think, you know, it, it's up to the designers to, to give you as much information to sort of make sure their kind of vision for the site is carried all the way through. And if they don't give that information, then someone else, probably a developer, and I'm a developer, and I've had to make lots of decisions, uh, design decisions before, um, and they've tended not to be very good ones because I'm not good at design. Um, so kind of, you know, it, it, it's kind of about having that culture of, well, look, this is your thing. Make sure that what you hand over is good and is, is so that when the developers get it, they're not making des design decisions um, because you don't want things designed by programmers generally. Great advice. Thank you. Next question here is from Curtis. They ask, why do you think hard time following normal flow? How could developers think in the same sequential order as the page? Mm, that's, I think it's, 
I think it is that just sort of not not really understanding the importance of markup to start with. Um, I think we have been through a bit of a period of just oh, just just put everything in a div, um, and you know you lose so much by doing that. I think that's the thing. You know, it's like we're handed you know, the ability to create accessible documents. That's the, that's the basics of the web. You know, we can write some fairly simple HTML, uh, marking up some content, and what you get is readable by like, everybody. And so everything you do as a developer um, has, the, has the chance of taking away from that almost. You know, you can make it worse than a plain document. Um, and so I think it, it really is kind of understanding that if we work with what we have, it's always easier. Because if you, you know, if, if for instance, we didn't have normal flow, if your starting point as a developer was all of your content stacked up top left because it wasn't laid out, that would be really hard work. Um, if you think about actually building a web page with just nothing, no structure, nothing, just a pile of words in the corner, um, and then you would have to sort of like position everything, that would be quite hard work. So I think it's, you know, it's it's kind of accepting that this is the way that a web page is displayed. It's displayed in normal flow, and that is useful because it saves you a, a lot of work. Um, and also remembering this idea that things go back to normal flow. So if you haven't marked up your document well, once you get inside a grid item, for example, you just get a jumble of stuff. If you've marked it up well, what you get inside your grid item, you know, heading and a list and a paragraph and it's all nicely marked up and it's it's displays so it, you know you, you're sort of you've got a good starting point there you can then start to make that look nicer or what have you um so yeah i think it's just it's kind of like easier way to work is to, to have a good document um you know remove the sizing information from headings and so on that you don't want but then start laying out from that point um, and you're saving yourself a job Fantastic, thank you. Next question here asks, what would your suggestions be about balancing our needs with browser support? So for example, if I need subgrid, but I also need more than Firefox, what advice would you give? Yeah, I mean, something like subgrid, it, obviously it, it depends on what you're building and sort of how far in the future you want to look. I mean, as I say, subgrid can be used pretty well as a, a progressive enhancement. Um, and so that's quite a, a useful tip if it is just for like little alignment things. So that's where subgrid is so useful. It's just for, you know, aligning sort of small components and so on. Now, at the moment, it's very hard to even get that effect. So you might say, well, actually, this is fine. You know, for browsers that um, don't support subgrid, it won't be quite as well aligned. Or, you know, you can obviously use feature queries and, and, and test for subgrid and do something slightly different for um, the older browser. Uh, but I mean, if you're building a site now, the likelihood is that subgrid is going to be in Chrome by the time you ship that site, unless it's like, you know, so you're just doing it over a weekend. If you're talking about your average project, then you might think, well, let's use this because it's probably going to be there. Um, but I think it's, you know, I think you have to take these things on a case by case basis. You, you know, there are always going to be things which lag behind because. You know, browsers have got different priorities in how quickly they implement things. But I would always look at those things that can be used as a progressive enhancement and say, well, does it actually really matter if, if we don't have this little finishing touch for a couple of months before this lands in the browser? And if that's the case, then, you know, go ahead and use it. Super. So Tanner asks, detecting the color scheme system setting is nice, but a common pattern is a light dark mode button on a page. Is it sensible to always offer light dark systems? Um, yeah, I mean, I think I think you do need to have both. As I mentioned, it's, it's kind of important that you allow people to get out of your choices. It's, it's a bit like, um, I remember when sort of responsive design in the early days of that, and, and at the time people would often force you into a mobile view of the site. Um, and uh, which was terrible and like missed out things and you couldn't get stuff you wanted and you were used to the desktop version and where things were and you um and you know some sites would give you a button that would let you load the desktop version on your phone even if you had to come kind of and scroll around um and that was often better because it gave you what you wanted so i think you should always give people the option to to toggle between 
um, the color schemes and, and what have you. Because, um, yeah, say, it may be that your dark mode isn't so accessible to them. They prefer the light mode on a site, even though they like dark theme on their, their desktop, you know, and the rest of the time. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's giving people, make best guesses about what people want, but allow them to escape, allow them to use the other thing if they decide that actually they prefer that. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, on a similar note, this person asks, these media features are really useful. Isn't there enough risk in terms of you? Is there risk in terms of user privacy um, if let in the hands of people with wrong intentions? Yeah, I mean, this that is something which is thought very hard about when these things, are, you know, are, are being planned. Um, I think, yeah, I mean, there is, I guess, the risk. I mean, I'm not a privacy expert. I mean, there is the risk that you know, with enough of these things, you could start to fingerprint people. Um, I think that's, but that is something that is um, identified as a risk with any of these sorts of things. Um, and, you know, when this, when, when designing CSS, um, for, for instance, you know, when you're writing a spec, one of the things that specs have to do is they have to go through a privacy review um, to make sure that CSS spec authors who may not be privacy experts don't leave something in there which could be used for for bad purposes um, because obviously the more we can figure out about a user the more chance there is of, of creating enough data to be able to figure out oh it's that user again um, and track them so yeah I mean there, there definitely is you know all sorts of useful things that we might want to be able to detect that we probably won't because because of that problem um, but it is something that yeah that people creating this stuff are, are very aware of as an issue. Thank you. Okay, I think we have time for one more question here. Uh, so this is from Ash. They ask, as a developer, how can I have better conversations with designers about accessibility and features like focus vis visible ARIA roles and so on? Yeah, I think showing the, you know, for, for a designer who maybe isn't a, a developer and, and doesn't really code, I think a lot of it is about sharing, you know, simple examples and showing them how, how it looks. Um, or showing them sites that are doing it really well. Um, and, and kind of because, you know, if you're not used to like poking around on a website with dev tools and understanding how things go together, then it can just all seem a little bit, you know, difficult to grasp. Whereas if you can show them an example, you know, say, look, oh, right, here's a website that is using, um, you know, that is reducing animation, for example. Um, and this is what the, the lower animation version looks like. And this is what the normal version looks like. And so actually showing examples. Um, with a lot of things, you know, I like to sit with designers and, and get them into dev tools. I did a workshop a few years ago now, which was all designers who didn't code. And we spent all day in dev tools, just trying things out, letting them poke around and change things and see how that worked. And that can be quite good, you know, because a lot of people have a bit of a block about coding. And then once they realize, oh, I can just change that, I can change that color, I can, you know, I can change that preference. And, and Actually, that's quite a good way, I think, to, to help designers sort of understand. But yeah, I think, you know, show, show good examples, show inspiring examples and show that it can be, that supporting this stuff can be fun and a really good part of the design process rather than like an annoying thing that we have to worry about. You know, I think that's the thing, turn it around, turn it into, look how cool this site is that manages to help, you know, all of these people with different needs. Um, and does it in a creative and, and, and useful way. So collect those resources and share them. Excellent. Thank you, Rachel, for your presentation today. I think that's a great note to end on. Uh, thank you, everybody, for your questions. And please enjoy the rest of AxCon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.